man, I can't get out of my own way today. Today is ridiculous. I'm sharing with you. I shouldn't be. I'm supposed to be putting on a huge professional air. Uh, I know. I know. We're all just trying to <laughs> make it look that way, and it's hardly ever that way behind the well, scenes. Well, I'm, I'm usually have my shit together, which is what drives me nuts on this one. All right, here we go. Welcome to the Shut Up and Do It Real Estate Podcast. I am your host, Nick Allard, creator of the REI Accelerated Coaching Platform and a principal with AA Real Estate Group. We buy, fix and flip, wholesale and rentals all across the United States. Uh, and uh, we have a brokerage and a property management company. And we have this podcast to try to bring you as much value as we possibly can by bringing on top quality guests and speakers, all who believe in a shut up and do it manner. So I'm so happy today to have our guest on today. This is a cool one. Wait till you guys hear this one. So this gentleman, we have Danny Johnson on from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we won't hold that against him that he is from the great state of Texas. <laughs> um, Danny's a veteran house flipper. He's done over a thousand deals. He achieved financial freedom. And then he went on to create a CRM called Forefront, which we're going to talk about today. And uh, he's also the host of the Flipping Junkie podcast as well as a new podcast, which we'll talk about a little bit later called Braver. We'll get into that. But uh, hey, Danny, thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, hey, thanks, Nick. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be super, here. Super cool. As always, let's hear a little bit about how you even got into real estate. I want you to go back to before real estate. Why real estate and why did you get into it? Okay, so why real estate? I got into real estate because I graduated college, computer science degree, was doing software development for a defense, defense contractor in San Antonio. And thank you for not holding that against me. Texas is the best, but um, <laughs> I usually have my 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 Patriots glass. I'd bring up at this point and oh, try yeah. to sip from it, but <laughs> Tom Brady left, so never mind. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so while I was, you know, after I, I graduated college, I was in my job, right, and and looking for excitement in that and creativity and all kinds of stuff in, in my job, and and I just wasn't having it. And at the same time, my dad started flipping houses. And hearing his stories about, you know, going all over town throughout the day, making offers and getting deals on properties. And, you know, he bought a new truck, a big truck, and he's driving and having all this fun, just completely changed his life. He was super excited. Well, that transferred to me. I had that same passion for all of a sudden, like I had that desire, that burning desire to do that as well. And so I decided to give it a go. Now, Talking about it after having been in 2003 makes it seem like I decided and then boom, started doing a bunch of deals. Didn't happen that way at all. Um, I took nine months, I think it was, to find the first deal. And I, I went through all the, the doubts. You know, he can do it, but I can't. Uh, it's not the same in San Antonio proper. He was doing in small towns around San Antonio. And uh, so struggle with that, but I got that first deal. The second one came much sooner and then kept going from there. I couldn't quit my job, though. It was like I was having fun as a hobby with the real estate, making good money doing that and actually losing money by not doing it full time. But that it was like the safety net of the job. And then this was secondary. So I felt like I didn't have any risk. Those golden right? handcuffs. Yeah. Them, right? So I was just I had to get fired from that job after three years to be able to go full time. I wish I could say I just, you know sacked up and did it i don't know if that's okay to say this but uh <laughs> but yeah i mean it took getting fired to do that and uh operated the business doing fix and flip you know just shortly after going full-time the market tanked right back mm -hmm. in um you know 07 08 and at that time my father was a mentor but also his mentor became my mentor and they were telling me there's no shame in going and get a job again. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I can't go back and get, I'll figure this out, right? I'll do something, but I'm not doing that, right? I'll buy much cheaper and just try to move them quickly. And, and I'll just deal with it. Luckily, Texas wasn't hit as hard. Mm. But at the time, we didn't know how hard we were going to get hit. Nobody did, right? So this, this idea was safe in some places and not others. I mean, you just, nobody knew where the bottom was in the market. But um, we transitioned to doing owner financing of properties and then turning around and selling the note the same day for, for a discount. So yeah. we were able to charge a little bit more because it was owner financing and banks were like super tight at that point, right? Nobody, like they were hardly lending at all. And so owner financing and selling the notes worked really well for several years until the market turned around. Let's, can um, I stop you there to go over some of yeah. that? So on the owner financing side, when you were getting... Um, First of all, no, I'm going to go backwards. Did you or your dad, even before you started, did you see your dad ever go through a bad deal? 
No. Okay. All right. So that gave a home run complex to Danny. And then Danny goes off, but I'm just kidding. I know you, you work for it, right? <laughs> so, and then you started before you got into owner financing, did you ever come across a bad deal? No, I came across challenges, tons of challenges. And that was the way, you know, some people will ask, well, I mean, or I, I assume people assume that it's like, well, your, your dad showed you how to do everything. Well, no, he didn't. He didn't even tell me what to read or learn. It was basically, I'm not going to walk you through, you're going to find like your own way of doing this. And when you have, you come across something you need help with, call me, but otherwise figure it out, right? Like just, and I wanted to, I didn't want to be going and saying what next, right? I was so interested in it that it just kind of went that way. So that was the relationship was basically, you know, just whenever I needed, you know, help with some kind of issue, but had definitely had some, some issues, some properties that came up with super interesting situations. There was one of the very early ones where this house had been burned, not horribly, but I think there was a small hole in the roof and smoke damage throughout the whole thing. And the people were living down the street. They had bought another house with the insurance money instead of fixing that one up. Mm. Well, so they stopped making payments on that house and they were way behind like a year and a half or something like that. And so we were like, well, let's do a short sale. So we did everything we could. We did a short sale. They, the balance was like 60 something thousand. Now, granted, this was, you know, almost 20 years ago, but 60 something thousand. We got it. The bank said, yeah, we'll sell it to you for, for you know, discount it and short it for uh, to 25,000, you know, as a short sale. And when we told the sellers that, that they finally agreed and they would sell for that, they, they said all of a sudden, how come they'll sell it to you for that much? But they won't let us pay it off for that much. There, there it is. All right. Yep. Yeah. Well, you kind of took the insurance money and went and bought another house instead of fixing up the asset that they had. So they're not real happy with you. <laughs> and I'm not even sure how all like what the legalities of all that stuff even are. But um, so so they were saying we're not going to closing. And I'm like, man, what the heck? And you know, what are we going to do? Well, we told the bank, hey, they, they said they're not going to closing. They're not real happy about it. And so the bank said, well, why don't you guys just buy the note? Ooh. And if, they're, if they don't pay, just foreclose. I was like, well, because I guess the bank didn't want to foreclose. They didn't want to deal with all that stuff. And I don't remember which, what the, which bank it was. So we decided, okay, well, let's go ahead and buy that note. So we bought the note for that much. Do you remember if and, that was a local or a national bank? Do you remember? I don't even, yeah, I don't even remember. Okay. It may all have right. been a local one. Cool. Um, and so we bought the note. And before anything happened, I got a call from an attorney and they, they said, hey, I've been talking to the seller over here, understand that you bought the note and uh, you know, I'd like to buy it. And it's a good thing that that happened because when we bought the note, the bank ended up telling us, hey, we can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an affidavit that you know, the, the, the note exists. We just can't find it because it was they acquired another bank or something and that bank had it. So there's the whole mess. And that's why they hadn't foreclosed in a year and a half or whatever the situation was. So we ended up with a real dicey situation. It's like we could try to foreclose and then something happens with you don't even have the original note. You know, we didn't know how that was going to go down. So that this attorney coming into the picture and saying, you know, I'll, I'll you know, short sale the note that you guys own and pay it off and pay more, you know, ended up working out. So we just did that. He paid it off and, uh, and then we made 25,000, I think it was, without having to touch the property. But, but learning through, like going through, jumping through all those hoops and learning about all of those things in one deal was pretty incredible. D totally. Yeah, you got it all. You had the short sale, you had the distressed seller, you had the angry seller that decided not to close. And then you had you, a note sale, which not many people get to, right? Because that's all about learning who the right contacts are and what the right banks are and how to approach them, right? And having mm -hmm. the credibility to show that you can take them down. With any, any, I know that today's not necessarily all about note sales, but is there, are there any tips you can give to people looking to do note sales? Uh, it's, it's been a long time since I've done a note sale. Uh, I, I keep every, all the notes now instead of selling them, but it's, it's shop around. It's really a shop around, find people. Uh, there's always somebody that's going to be willing to, you know, take, buy it for less of a discount, right? Because the discount is how much off of the, the value it is or whatever. So, you know, just, just shopping around to find uh, somebody to, uh, to give you more. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the only thing I can really say about that. Gotcha. No, brilliant. All right. So back to where we were, you would owner finance that deal. Uh, and you sold the note for more than it was. 
keep us going through your journey here. So we yeah. Got. So let me see. We, it was my ex-wife and I, we, we did everything in the business. We wore all the hats, all right? So we were doing a good amount of deals, uh, once we went full time and then brought her in and, uh, we were doing a good amount of deals per year, but it was like, we hit this point where we had success in the business doing this, right. But we wanted more success. And the only thing we knew to do was just do more work, right. Do more of what we were doing. And I, and I want to talk quite a bit about this because it's a real interesting thing that I've really been thinking a lot about recently in that I feel like we could have grown much quicker and, uh, you know, like what kept us held back in that? Why, why were we trying to do everything ourselves for so long? What was, what was going on at that point? And, you know, what I can figure is that basically going into this business sort of like as a hobby. And like I said, too, when I had that job, I couldn't leave because that was sort of my hobby. It was sort of like, I don't want to make that my work. And it's interesting because it became my work. And that's the first time I think ever that I've said that. But anyway, it became like my work. And um, interesting, isn't it? Good to get a new yeah. perspective. Yeah. 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 So it's, it became like my work and, you know, but, but I, I didn't want it to be, I wanted it to be like the fun thing always. And having employees or having help bringing somebody in to help us out was like this whole responsibility thing. You know, I'm going to take on some people. All of a sudden the business has to be more professional. We've got to like make sure we can cover, you know, these employees and all this kind of stuff. And I'll have to manage employees. I'll have to run a business like a business. And that, I think that scared the heck out of me. And really it was like this, uh, this whole idea at the time too was, you know, I was sold on, real estate investing, providing freedom, right? Financial freedom, time freedom, all that kind of stuff. So what's going to happen when I bring some employees on and I want to go on vacation for two months, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to be able to do that. Or so I thought, right? But I've realized as I've matured quite a bit and aged quite a bit that that was, you know, like false beliefs. It was like the wrong perspective of the whole thing. Because we never actually through all those years, years got to do that, where we got to take two months of vacation without a worry or concern. Because guess what? Like I'm the one doing the marketing, taking the calls. <laughs> we try to even go on a weekend and to get a call Friday evening for a home run deal. Oh, that stresses me out. Who the heck's going to go look at it and make an offer? Competitors going to snatch it up. You like all those fears, all that kind of stuff. It just really stunk. Mm -hmm. Like it really was not what I thought, but I, I was ignoring that that was actually happening, right? Like the still yeah. belief that we're running this thing that gives us freedom that we can just turn off like that and not have to deal with never really existed. Yes. Yes. So let's go to your very first hire, Danny. So you, are you still with your ex-wife at that point? Yeah, um, you are. Okay. So let's go over the mentality of what, how your first hire went. Did you have a conversation with her? Did she try to push you? What happened? Yeah, actually, that was with, um, actually, I, I met Justin Williams, who's out in California from Seven Figure Flipping, all that kind of stuff. I met him, and he he kind of showed me that it was completely possible. I actually flew out to see him after talking with him, then, like the next day or two days after, to hang out with him, and just, you know, see that that was, like, that could really happen, that you could have somebody come in and do better than you in your business, and, and really make true freedom for yourself. And so it still took a little while for me to actually go and hire somebody though. And, and we ended up hiring my brother-in-law actually was the, the first one to come in and start doing acquisitions with me. Mm -hmm. And I learned a whole lot from that interaction because it was basically all I did was, I was like, all right, shadow me for, for like a week and then you're on your own. <laughs> you know, it was, I was just like, oh man, I don't know. I've got a thing about managing people, but um <laughs> So that didn't, I mean, that worked okay. It didn't work out so hot. He did pretty well for, for a while. Um, we, we did learn from that. And as we, we brought in more people realized, hey, you know, we've got to set up processes. We've got to make it, you know, where people are following what we want them to do instead of having them assume or, or assuming that they know what we do after telling them all of this stuff that we flood them with. And so we started creating processes using Google Drive and uh and hired people and and man that just created true freedom i mean that really did that created that was so nice to finally i i i really fought for a long time to, to give up the whole acquisitions like going to seller appointments mm -hmm. 
thinking mm-hmm. like, you know, I had this whole thing of we, I grew up poor, you know, I grew up struggling. My, my dad was always starting new businesses and failing. We, you know, I changed elementary schools every single year when I was in elementary school, I think I had to go to a new one every year we were getting evicted. And, uh, and so I like, wow. I felt like I had this thing where this connection with a lot of the motivated sellers, like I've been here in a place of some of them, you know, their situations and that I could relate and all that kind of stuff. Not that I ever talked to them about that, but, you know, it just was like the whole genuine kind of uh, personality coming in there. But that, I mean, that was just another thing keeping me in my comfort zone. It's like, I didn't want to give up this, this thing that I felt like I had to do. And so having someone else do that, it was just so glorious because I got so sick of going to those appointments. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think I remember moments where I, I showed up because I, I was like, I want to go running. I, I know there's appointment right after this, but I want to go running. So I'm going to go running and then I'm going to go to the appointment. Well, I, I showed up in what I ran in. So in my shorts and like tank top and like flip flops or something or running shoes is like sort of sweaty. And at that moment, I was like, I am, this is horrible. Mm, <laughs> like, yeah. Trying to yeah. live the lifestyle and, and, but not run the business like a true business is, is creating failure, really was. Totally. So, and, and you know what, though, Danny, you and I have that in common where we have been in those situations and we can relate to the motivated sellers. And I was in the same boat as you, as, you know, as far as when I, I've been in this business uh, for about 16 years, so three years less than you. And I only actually learned what scaling meant about five years ago. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, it took me that long because I'm like, I'm the one who can actually realize what these sellers are feeling and thinking. And I have the emotional intelligence and I have that shared, you know, empathy that I went through the same stuff they did. So therefore, I am the only one who can go through seller appointments. Right. And, and also, my team makes fun of me now. My seller appointment, I would always get the contract, but they're always like two and a half, three hours long. You know, I was that guy and I, I'm still that guy if I go out there. So I'm not even the right one to, to, to try to train with, but I a hundred percent agree with you. And let me ask you this, when you hired, it was your brother or brother-in-law, you said brother-in-law, yeah, brother-in-law. So when your brother-in-law started with you, um, was it difficult to see your close rate go down a little bit oh, when yeah. you were training, right? Yeah, there were concerns. I mean, and it was like one of those things, well, we'll just you know, let, let it improve. And then we made some more hires and, and, you know, transition people. And, you know, it, it actually eventually ended up after, I think it was maybe the, the next hire after that was one that things started really getting a lot better uh, with our acquisitions. And, uh, you know, he was doing, I think, better than I ever did the mm, next one. Wow. How did you support or give them training? The new, the new folks? The new ones, we ended up, I think we ended up doing the, the John Martinez training, sales yes. training. I think that made a huge difference. Yes, and, we do that too. He was a former guest on our podcast too, absolutely. Yeah, he's awesome. And and just, and I don't think that you have to use things exactly as it's given, but I think it gives you some pointers and tips to, to use along with whatever your real personality, as long as you can be genuine with it all, right? And not just using tactics for tactics sake. Right. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what we did. It made it, it really did make a huge difference. I did uh, Flipping Houses Exposed, which was a book, but that originally was blog post. And that was 34 weeks of my business. I documented every single motivated seller lead. This is while we were still doing everything ourselves. Mm-hmm. 495 leads in, in 34 weeks. Motivated seller leads saying, hey, make me an offer. I documented every single one of those. When I look back, I think I only closed, I did 11 or 13 deals out of those. Okay. That's like one out of every that's, that's, five leads. Yeah. Yeah. Horrible. Really. It, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing even a little bit. And so looking back at it, the mindset was we need more deals. Let's do more marketing. Let's find another marketing channel. Let's pump some money into that. Let's do that. All right. It's still profitable. We're still making money. But you end up in this trap where you're spending all this time generating all these leads and doing this marketing and handling all those calls, going to those appointments, you know, trying to follow up, all that kind of stuff. When if you just stopped and looked at what's happening when those leads are coming in and fixing those parts of your business, because you know, we ended up when, after we started making the hires and we got really systematized in the business, did some of the trainings, 
we went from that one out of every 45 during that time period to about one out of every five or one out of every seven leads became a deal. There we go. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Right. And it was, and so, and it was because keep, keep going. How did you get to that close rate? Yeah. So it was, you know, having people dedicated for things is one big part of it. Right. So uh, I was still handling a lot of marketing. I could take time to look at the numbers from the market. Right. And see what's going on with that. We could try out sources that were producing deals, not just leads. Sometimes you'll get something that produces a lot of leads, but you hardly get any deals. That's a lot of work for the whole team and they don't pan out. So measuring all that stuff. Right. And then having somebody dedicated to take calls always, right? Answering, live answering that phone, no matter what, that's their job. They're always available to do it. If I'm doing marketing, I'm running around, checking on rehabs, I'm going to appointments. I can't take those calls most of the day. So that's, that's a huge problem there. If I'm second to talk to that person, they talk to one of my competitors, you know, the person that talks to them first does have an advantage I found. Yes. And so having somebody dedicated to that and boost, boost the conversion rate, then having somebody dedicated to acquisitions, right? There were times where I was frustrated. I was saying, our acquisitions guy is going on like 10 appointments a week. Like what's he doing the rest of the time? <laughs> but that's really actually quite a bit for somebody, right? To really yeah. take the time to go and not be rushed, right? You, you can't yeah. be rushed. Three hour go... seller appointments right here. What's that? <laughs> Three hour seller appointments right yeah, here, yeah. but 100% right. close rate. <laughs> that's right. I mean, but, but that's what it's all for, right? All that other stuff that we're doing leads up to that. So that's where we, you should spend time, right? I mean, that's everything else you did led up to that. So if you can't convert there, everything else was a waste. I mean, to some extent, like follow-up helps, but, um, and so he, you know, the, the acquisition person has time to go to the appointment, get there a little bit early, sit up front, uh, do exercises if they want, like visualizing, getting the appointment, uh, getting the contract, all that kind of stuff. It helps going in, resetting from whatever happened before that previous appointment didn't pan out. Yep. The person laughed at you, yelled at you, whatever time to reset, get the energy the out. Yep. Yep. Right. And then, and that changed things quite a bit. And then having the ability to do follow-up and, and, you know, lead intake can spend a lot of time calling old leads um, while they're waiting for calls to come in and stuff like that. So, I mean, all those things add up and a lot of it really improves when, when you're taking a look at the numbers in your business. And this gets back into this hobby versus true business thing. Because a true business can give you freedom, can give you that lifestyle. And it doesn't mean you're losing like your freedom in doing that. And I had that weird thing going on where I was thinking that, but like measuring those KPIs and like week over week gives you that confidence that everything is just running smooth. You can let go of this like thing that we've got to like, oh God, oh God, you know, got to make it happen, got to make it happen. You know, you kind of see things improving and, and if something's not improving, you, you know it, right? You have those weekly meetings you look at the numbers and then you have a discussion and it's awesome. So is this, uh, and this is good to get in for some of our viewers. We've had discussions on KPIs and is this using like the EOS or traction system? Right. Yeah. Used? yeah. Yeah. L10 meetings. So, yep. so what um, KPIs would you say are the best indicators for your, and K, you can even define KPIs for some of these folks. What are the best ones you use as indicators to say if your business was going well or not? Yeah. So there's a, I mean, forefront, we built them in, so we don't have to calculate them. They just like real time week over week. You can see them all the time. There's mm -hmm. 27 of them in there, but in general, this is using the, your forefront CRM too. Right. So this is, right. yeah, got it. We'll get there. Yeah, Cause but, I yeah. like the way out. Like if you have, you used 90 before it's called 90. 90. Yeah. 90 to IO. It's a oh. software version of, of level 10 meetings. So you can run your meetings through the software. Oh, and neat. put your KPIs in there and you have everything from EOS inside of it. It's, it's by the same people mm -hmm. and it's super cool, but you have to put the KPI numbers in. You have to pull those up and then put them in there. So I was like, why are we doing this when we have all this data in the CRM? It can just calculate and show it to us. So anyway, we did that. But um, the KPIs that, that are most important are really just like the number of leads, right? The number of qualified leads, not the take me off your list, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the number of, of appointments, the number of canceled appointments. That's a good one. Yep. Yeah. And then you want to know who canceled, right? If you get a lot high number, who's canceling us or them, who's rescheduling, who's doing what that tells you a lot. Yes. The number of, uh, offers. Offers on the appointments. Yep. Yep. Number of contracts and then, you know, deals and, and that kind of thing. 
And really a lot of those, those main ones at the top, though, give you a lot of information. I'll give an example about one thing that was interesting before that, that happened to us. We noticed that our using the same marketing channels and stuff, the, the, getting a certain number of leads and appointments, that our appointments started dipping. Like the number of appointments that we were getting set up started dipping. And so we looked into it. We're like, what's going on with this? Why, is, why are we not getting these? I mean, is, has the quality of the leads like died down from these sources? And it turned out that our lead intake was, was saying that the people aren't motivated, so they're not setting appointments. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, what, what happened, man? Like, what, why did you start assuming this kind of stuff? Like, if there's equity, set the appointment. Don't, you know, don't make assumptions about the, uh, and, and, and a lot of times, some, I think I told somebody else this, and they said, I wonder if they got yelled at. And there's a, that's a big thing. You know, acquisitions people, if there's some kind of change in behavior in them, or if there's a change in behavior in leading take someone that's talking with, with sellers, mm -hmm. you know, getting yelled at a couple of times can really start changing your opinion on what you're doing. Absolutely. I love that. We, we had a similar issue where our, and it's funny because the lead intake, we call them lead manager, right? And acquisitions rep, they're different personality profiles, right? At least that's what we have. We have, our lead intake is typically a higher I on the disc scale right? Which is more inter interact, like social, I'm, I feel for you, let's discuss, let's go through things and talkative versus the acquisitions folks have to have a higher D because they have to get there. They still have to have that emotional intelligence to work through the appointment, but then they have to ultimately say, let's go over to this table and walk through things and see if this makes sense. Um, our I, our lead intake was doing exactly that. Like they almost appreciated getting to follow up with them every week or two weeks and not set the appointment <laughs> just to check in and chat versus getting an appointment set, right? With the appointment right. setters. So we had a similar type of issue. Did you ever come across you know, the, the uh, personality profiles or did you, did you, did you work we through did, those? But, but Mike's wife handled a lot of that because so I, you know, I know about the D for the salespeople, but the rest of it, I really don't. Yeah. I don't remember a lot of it. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and I want to move into from your KPI. I'm going to add one more KPI too that you didn't mention. He mentioned all of them. So if you folks are listening here uh, and you're just joining us, this is the Shut Up and Do It Real Estate Podcast. Uh, we're here interviewing Danny Johnson, who's done a, uh, over a thousand deals and he's in, based in San Antonio. And then he moved into uh, creating a CRM called Forefront. And he also runs the Flipping Junkie Podcast, as well as a new podcast we're going to be hearing about shortly called Braver. Uh, and He's also chatting, he just mentioned some KPIs. So I would rewind about a few minutes and you'll see where he labels, lays out the most important KPIs for your business. What I'm gonna add to that, Danny, and uh, at the very end, it's, uh, it's uh, signed offers to closing. Because hmm. we've had, right, we've had signed offers that end up very similar to your situation with your short seller, right? The seller that you try to go short with, you know, we have a short sale negotiation firm and I would say there's at least 2% of those folks that even when you get to the close of the finish line, even when you've done all the work and you got the negotiations done, offers are all signed, everybody's good. They still either, number one, pull what they did with you, right? Wait a second, why aren't <laughs> I getting a good deal here? I wanna get more out of this property or why isn't the bank doing that for me? And not, or, right, they, uh, they, they drop off face of the earth. They've, they've gotten too overwhelmed, so they shut down. And you can't get a hold of them. They won't sign closing docs and they won't sign contracts. So uh, we, we had that as a KPI too, whereas, you know, signed offers to closing, sometimes they do just drop off. And at that point, mm. there's some investors I know that will go through the lawsuit process, but we found that that's not effective. So we just sort yeah. of, you know, we just kind of say goodbye to them. Um, yeah, that's a but, good one. Yeah. So uh, we're moving into, uh, you were tracking your figures. And as you mentioned earlier, you could find a way when leads came in, to make that a much more efficient process and maybe add some things to it that helped your conversion rate for appointments. Mm -hmm. um, did this all lead, I'm just guessing at this, by the way, did this all lead into you finally creating, you're saying I, I'm using four or five different pieces of tools here. I'm just going to create something that solves some problems. Is that what happened? Yeah, sort of. I mean, being that I have the software background, I've always built systems to, to kind of keep track of leads and, and had some crazy ideas about some things that were going to show me the hottest deals on the MLS that took a lot of development time only to find out that if I just went into the MLS and like 
sorted by lowest price first. I found like <laughs> the same ones. So was, this algorithm I built was not a very good algorithm. But anyway, uh, the, the, like I've been building software for a long time for that. And as we had that team, that became invaluable because we made a web-based one because you know that way the team we all had access to the same stuff. We could, if someone was following up that didn't deal with the acquisitions or didn't deal with the seller meeting or anything, they could see what was going on, and and have a a, a good conversation with them because everybody had the notes about everything, and um, that that makes a big difference whenever you're talking to somebody that that the company talked to a month ago, that had a situation where you know, maybe they stopped talking to us because their uncle ended up having to go for emergency surgery or something and something happened. And you can call and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to hear about your uncle, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's a super professional um, relationship kind of based thing that you're doing that's really going to help you get get the deals. And so having that system really helped out. Then I, I had become a part of, uh, I was already a part of uh, Justin's group, but we got more involved in that. And being there, we heard from a lot of bigger, higher level investors saying, hey, you know, Podio sucks and we want to be able to do this. We want to be able to do that. And I was like, well, why don't I just develop it? That <laughs> became an issue because you're talking about people that, for the most part, need custom solutions at a certain point when you need multiple markets doing a bunch of crazy stuff. And so what we built sort of was like the Homer Simpson car, if you're like a Simpsons fan. Mm -hmm. Homer got a chance to design a car. It had, <laughs> it had a, just do a Google search for Homer Simpson. I remember though, I want a horn in every single place, right? When I'm <laughs> mad, you can never find the horn when you're mad. I remember that line. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's kind of what we felt like. And, and also being like our own customer, like when we rolled this thing out, we, we like built the whole thing over like a span of over a year, I think it was. And, um, and then launched it. And then it's like, when you do that with a ton of features, it's just like a problem because nothing is fully tested, you know, like, like everybody does weird stuff with it that you never intended, all that kind of stuff. And so we had some bugs and everything. It just became like kind of a nightmare. It was like a big, like usability kind of sucked. So we were redesigning interfaces saying, we're gonna have to rebuild all this. And at that time was when I started going through, uh, you know, separation from my wife and, and that divorce was, was really painful. And so it was like, you know, my, my team, my software team, the core team came up to me. It was like, Hey, I think we got to restart on this. We need to, I know you just spent all this money on this, but we, we probably should rebuild. And uh, so it was a tough thing. I mean, it was a I probably, I think it was over a million dollars to build that other one. I had to just say, okay, you know what? I, I trust you guys. I think you're right. Let's do that. And it's, it's weird how things kind of, and this maybe can get into some of the uh, uh, vulnerability stuff, some of the things that we experience that we don't share too much. But I, I was learning how to surrender, right? And because before everything was just like, I want to have this many deals. I want to be able to do this. I want to do that. And you try to control everything, right? Everything's got to go the way you need it to. Otherwise, you're just like stressed and frustrated and pissed off. And um you know, I found that like, wow, I was like really trying to make sure everything, I was just so stressed out because I'm trying to do a million things and have it all go the way I want it. And life doesn't work out that way a lot of times. And so it was kind of like, you know, God saying, okay, well, you're going to learn how to, how to let go, you know, because all this stuff's going to happen at one time for you and you're not going to be able to deal with it. And I couldn't. Um, so that was, that was interesting. And, and from there, I've gotten more into spirituality and, and more into, you know, surrendering to life and what, what's going on with life. Uh, and, and actually, there's a statement by Michael Singer. He's a, he's a writer, published a couple books. Untethered Soul and yeah. the Surrender Experiment. Yes. yes, sir. Excellent books. And he talks about like the world is pretty darn amazing, right? The, the, how everything is and the fact that we're able to breathe and we got all this water, water falls from the sky and, you know, all this kind of stuff happens. It's pretty darn amazing. And it's like, and you think that you have a better idea of how things should happen, right? like, like in controlling things, right? Then, then what's naturally going to happen and right. Some things we might feel are bad. Some things are good, but he actually in their surrender experiment. Um, have you read that? I have. Yeah, so in the, the surrender experiment, he decided at an early age to surrender, whether he liked it or not, to whatever was coming up in his life. Ended up building that software company that sold for $3 billion. 
-hmm. you know, and, and, uh, and it's interesting to try to live that is not so easy, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? To try, because it's the question of, okay, well, what am I, like, what is, what is life showing me right now, right? You can get all hung up in that too. Like, what is the right direction or decision? But it was interesting because when I look back at the, 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 re, the closing of that software and, you know, the divorce happening at that point when I couldn't function, like I could not handle all of it. I would sit in my office and my desk for, for, for days, just sitting there. Like, I just couldn't, I was like, I was just stunned. Yeah. And this was months. Right. And so the fact that, you know, the team stepped up and different things happened, you know, that was letting life happen. And that's not to say that I'm going to do that now, or I'm just going to sit here and, Oh, it'll be fine. You know, I don't do that kind of <laughs> thing, but, but listening to, you know, what's coming up and what's, what's happening. It's, it's pretty, and so I'm still trying to figure that out, trying to, and it's not even a figuring out, it's more of a relaxing into, you know, like, Hey, I'm, I'm getting, it's really being open to whatever's happening. Right. So it's, I've gotten three calls from different people about doing this with the software. Maybe, you know, I should look into that and just talk, like have those conversations or whatever and see what comes of it. Yeah. And so it's just stuff like that. Instead of saying, no, I want it to be this way. I want to do this. And I'm going to ignore all that because this is what I want. <laughs> Danny, I had no idea this, this show was going to turn towards this element, but um, and I, I don't assume you've been following a couple of those episodes before, but you and I have something very similar in common where I also had a divorce that crippled my business. And this was just um, just in the last couple of years. Right. And, and, and just, you know, I, I only, I was told to stay off social media all of 2020 because we were going through the, the, the worst of the battle that year. It was a three-year battle, but um, you know, it's funny how this, we go through these things only to come because I didn't believe in surrendering. I did not believe in letting go. Like you and I were, were, it seems like we're both type a, right. We're both, we, we know, we know how to, produce we know how to create we know how to add value we want it now we know how to build a team so we're going to build this team and it's going to function this way and we're going to make processes because that's how you build a team right right and this is all relatable because when the day comes and we finally have made sacrifices every time we add something right we there's 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 always a sacrifice now we might not see that sacrifice but we can't add and add and add and add and take on more and more and more and more without acceptable losses and it sounds like in both your and my case, being producers and creators and value adds and loving opportunities and things coming our way and wanting to just act on them, it, pro it costs us marriages, right? Mm -hmm. it, there, there's one cost of there that was a marriage and my ex was also a business partner. So, um, you know, here we are. It's just interesting that this show turned in this direction. But for, for those of you folks that are listening to this, um, the whole point of this podcast Shut up and do it podcast. Yes, we talk about real estate mechanics. And yes, we talk about business mechanics and people overcoming challenges and struggles. The biggest struggle that I've ever had, and for those of you who watch the show, you know I've had uh, eight hard reset buttons as they're, they're called. I learned something in every single one of those eight resets. But the hardest one ever has been uh, the loss of your family and the threat of even having children taking away from you. And you have to prove, right, that you're a fit father. And you have to prove, and all these, and all of a sudden, everything else no longer matters, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I found myself sitting at my desk saying, what the hell do I do today? Uh, without another subpoena, I don't have my kids right now. What do I do? <laughs> so thank you for being vulnerable. And yeah. I wanted to applaud you. And I, and I it helps me become vulnerable. And I, I want our, show, our listeners to understand this is the whole point of this show. Uh, everyone can learn real estate mechanics. Anyone can learn how to wholesale, fix and flip, and even build a team, especially if you go back and listen to a whole bunch of our episodes. We talk about how to scale, how to build teams. And Danny, specifically today with his CRM and his KPIs and talking about his journey, you can get so much value just out of hearing him. But the biggest value today might be um, there is a future after, right, after a disaster, a personal disaster or a personal struggle. And the best way to come through it and to find it, it's not to sit down and plan your way out of it. Uh, the yeah. best way is to, you know, some books that, that Danny recommended, Surrender Experiment. The best way is to, what did you say? Ease into uh, a, a bigger plan, whether you believe yeah, in God or Buddha or whatever. Relax and be open to, yeah. 
to what what's coming up i mean because it's it's interesting because it's like oh it's almost like i'm i wasn't seeing you know the the signs that were given to me or the you know what was going on i wasn't seeing it because i was so tunnel vision focused and it's interesting because i just remember that the the book that got me a little bit more into spirituality was a book by um uh, deepak chopra i think his name was mm -hmm. yeah and it was something like seven spiritual laws of success or something like that so it had like a business like uh you know slant to it which was why i was bothered to like even read it and then it like got me into this whole thing because i think he talked a lot about you know how this whole idea of being so narrowly focused versus being open because you get to see so many like that's that's how you let intuition happen right and we start to be a little bit more in tuned in what's right for us because we can hear about all the success somebody's having in this other thing and want to go do that you know but like you said there's 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 issues with that we only can do so many things and sometimes we're doing those things for the wrong reason like we're we could get excited about that because we're avoiding this responsibility we have over here in this other business or family or whatever it is right yeah tough That's stuff. Sometimes. we can do anything but we can't do everything that's right <laughs> and we don't have to do everything which is the good thing you know that's it's pretty cool that's it yeah we find our niches and find our specialties danny uh didn't know it was going to take this turn but i'm happy it did and as i said before there are no coincidences so i'm, I'm very happy that the reader that the listeners who are going to listen to this and watch this uh we absolutely hopefully will resonate with at least a few of those um and that's our goal right is is to change even one life here so Let's talk about your um, your new podcast um, and and you know what you're excited about. What are you excited about coming up? Yeah, so the you know the obviously forefront CRM. You know we rebuilt and we got to do it in a fun way. It was really cool because we we decided to get rid of all the assumptions and start from what is this thing even for? Because in the CRM game, it's like who's got the longer feature list. <laughs> <laughs> and, and typically, whoever's got the longer feature list has the most complicated, uneasy, like difficult thing to use that people like Podio, right? It'll do a lot, but you're going to bang your head against the wall forever trying to get that thing to work the way you want amen. it to. Amen. Yep. Amen. <laughs> and so we said, let's get rid of all that. Like it's, it's for making sure that nothing slips through the cracks, first and foremost, right? You're managing your leads and deals and then follow up. And what can we automate to take stuff off our shoulders, right? So that we can let things operate. So... That's what it is. And throughout this entire process, you know, we've, we've, every two weeks, we get a QA and a call with customers. We talk about what's coming up. We, we show them mock-ups, say, Hey, we know we can't think of all the possible angles of this. Here's what we got. What do you guys think? Let's get some input. And then we develop and that's how we do a roadmap too. So everybody's kind of building this with us. It's really cool doing it that way. And we're not just trying to have the most features. We're trying to make the most usable, you know, you know powerful, but simple tool which is really cool and i think we've achieved that now the braver podcast um that i decided to start because flipping junkie is is geared towards a newer investor and I, i've done a ton with that and i think back at episode 16 way back in the beginning i decided i'm gonna make this sort of like an online like a, 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 a audio training course right mm -hmm. instead of doing these this episode's about this, this next episode's about something completely different, which some people like the variety, but I wanna do something like that. So I did episode 16 to like 60 something, started with foundation, mindset, motivation, and then worked all the way up to like, you know, renting properties or something. Mm -hmm. And it was like all the things in between, like lead in, like, um, you know, marketing, acquisitions, wholesaling, all that kind of stuff, all the way through all those episodes. So that's all there. But I wanted to start talking about you know, what we've, what we spent too long doing, doing everything ourselves in the business, my ex-wife and I, you know, with us wearing all the hats and, and getting into like, what was it, like I've said before in this podcast, you know, what was it that kept us from building that team and having the, the true freedom that we wanted? What was, what was holding us back? And so it was taking a look at, at the fears that we had that maybe we didn't even know we had. I know I didn't know what I had. I was avoiding that. And so the whole reason why I named it Braver was because I was listening to a Jordan Peterson YouTube video and whether you love him or hate him, like he, he said something about, um, you know, uh, fear. And he said in the, the clinical studies, you know, fear doesn't typically go away. He said, what happens is you become braver. 
Mm. And he's like, and but what he said about that is what I really love. He said, you got two options because that thing is there. Something that you're afraid of is there, right? That's reality. If you don't choose voluntarily to look at it, you're, you're closing, you're shutting in, protecting yourself. And it's not going to be good for you, right? It's just not good for you. The other choice is to look at it voluntarily and it becomes a call to adventure, you know, because you're like, you know what? I see this. I know I'm afraid of it. I know I need to do it or whatever. And I'm going to do it anyway, even though I'm afraid. And then you grow braver and you, you deal with it and you do things like that. And it's, you know, you look at it from this, this point of view of taking it on and not cowering from it. So that's easily understood, I think, conceptually, right? But in like real world terms, like the things that we're maybe avoiding, there's a reason. It, it, it's like the whole talk of that, right? Like, I'm not going to look at it because I'm actually protecting myself from it. So why are you telling me to look at these things? I'm, I'm not even aware that I'm even protecting myself against, but, but that's what we should do. So that's what the podcast is about. I bring on investors and we you know, I, I ask them about where they're at, the transitions and what kinds of things right now they're afraid of. So it's pretty cool. Love it. And there it is, right? Similar, similar mindset right there. Because most of the time we can all learn mechanics, but it's the fear that holds us back, right? Right. It's the fear that holds us back. I love, love, love this concept, Danny. So this is very cool. Uh, just curious and putting you on the spot, we did not talk about this beforehand, but would you be willing to provide our listeners with any sort of... Uh, uh, look at or, or just kind of pricing for the, for CRM for a certain amount of time or no, would that be a no-go on that? Yeah. I mean, we've got a 14 day free trial. Um, and we actually have it priced low right now because we're, you know, we're growing the, the platform and getting more and more people on. So we're keeping it low for the time being. And it's, unli- it's a very simple pricing structure. It's unlimited users. A lot of the CRM systems are paying like per seat and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. There's no setup fee. It's uh, you know month to month. You can cancel whenever you want, and it's only one thirty seven a month at, at the time of this podcast. Mm-hmm. And uh, unlimited users, unlimited leads, contacts, all that kind of stuff. So it's a great deal. And um, I do have uh, a gift to give if if anybody wants to get it. It's you know a lot of people are are working so hard, like I mentioned before, at, at trying to get more deals by by doing more marketing, right? Generating more leads. And a lot of times, if, if you're not following up for even years for the leads that you already had, you've got gold in those old leads. You know, you've, you, if you just stopped and called them, it could have been a year ago that you talked to them, but they may still own that property. Mm. And time has a way of motivating people. And so I, I just put together a, um, a sequence of emails and texts that you can send that are not salesy, that are not pushy, that just try to get the conversation going again with all your old leads. And you can get that at ForefrontCRM.com slash reactivate. That's Forefront, F-O-R-E-F-R-O-N-T, CRM.com slash reactivate. And that's because you're reactivating old leads, right? Turning them yeah. back into new ones. Yeah, we'll put those in the show notes too. And uh, and knowing us folks, we're going to try to work with Danny and see if we can't get something a little special for our listeners too. It sounds like that's a great deal though. I don't know how we're going to beat it, but I'm going to work on it. So we'll find it. We'll find a way. Um, Danny, this was an awesome, awesome session. I didn't anticipate it going this long, but it, it took directions that we wanted it to take, right? There are no coincidences. So, right. um, are there, uh, any final words to anybody you want to share? No, I, I, well, I guess there is like the, um, whenever you're faced with a, a decision, as hard as it is, sometimes trying to sit there and rack your brain with what the right call is, maybe try taking a day or two of not even thinking about it and see if things happen to show you the right way to go with it. It's completely different than I ever lived, but trying to do that now, it's, it's just, it makes it so much easier. It's really nice. I love that. Try it. Because type A people though, Danny, we have to make decisions quickly. And we have, we are on top of things and we know exactly how they're going to work out. And we know the process. We don't need anybody explaining to us how the things are going to work out. But for those of you who didn't just hear what Danny said, right? Let, there's a, there's a very big power in that surrender. Even if it's for that 24 hours, see if you are guided by an intuition that you didn't even know you had, because three years ago, I did not believe in any of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's what it, he does, right? The universe will come down and throw something in our, in our path. And all of a sudden, things can get manifested, literally manifested just by our energies. So cheers to that, man.
Yeah. And I'm grateful for all the, the struggles I went through in the last couple of years with all of that, because I would have never, it took something like that to get me to, to see this stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And same here for the, that's the very, very reason we started this podcast, but it was it's before possible. I had all my issues. So <laughs> here we are still, still spreading the message. It's hey awesome. folks, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today to see another episode of the shut up and do it real estate podcast. Um, where we show, share top quality guests and speakers, all who believe in a shut up and do it manner. And in some cases, we go deep, as you saw today. We're super thankful for Danny Johnson today from San Antonio with Forefront CRM and Flipping Junkie podcast and Braver podcast for being on ours today and sharing his journey and what he experienced. We went through some KPIs. We went through some uh, how to help with deal conversion when you get to a certain level. And of course, how to scale the business and try to get away from that fear of scaling your business, which is really what it's all about. Danny, thank you for your time. Also, if you're local to, local to the Boston market, be sure to check out our uh, group that's been around for a few years, but we're finally back in live in person. reiunleashed.com is our local Boston-based uh, networking group. We do that one, every third Tuesday of every month. And uh, definitely make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons below. It really helps us out. So you can get notified when we launch these. We launch them every Thursday at one o'clock. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you on the next one.